We present Beowulf, an original adaptation, written and read for you by John Buckeridge. Part 3 The Soil of Daneland. The spear sped straight towards Beowulf's chest. The thrust, delivered with perfect form and timing, had taken him by surprise, and his shield was in just the wrong place. Or perhaps just the right place for his opponent. With the kind of clarity only adrenaline can produce, he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he could not bring it up in time to stop the strike. Twisting his shoulders, he tried desperately to bring his chest off the killing line. He was off balance, his stance and structure were broken, and even if this worked, he had no idea what he would do next. The spear tip missed his chest by a hair's breadth, but even as he celebrated that victory, he realized the truth. This had never been the true attack. The spear drew back like a serpent's tongue, and the shaft swept underneath him, striking at his already unbalanced legs. The world pitched backwards as the ground came up to meet him, and he felt the air knocked roughly out of his lungs. His vision spanned as he heaved in breath and by the time his focus recovered, his eyes came to rest on the tip of a spear pointing at his face. Not for the first time, he was glad it was blunt. "'And now you are dead,' his father remarked, and Beowulf groaned. "'How did I beat you?' Sighting along the spear from his place on the ground, Beowulf grunted out, "'You are better than I am.' From the other end of the spear, his father exhaled in frustration, it has nothing to do with skill and everything to do with you. Three years you have been training as a warrior and still you cannot control your rage. You fight with your heart, not with your head. Big actions, huge sweeping strikes, like you're trying to fell a tree with each blow. If I strike a man hard, he will not get back up, Beowulf protested. If you strike him, his father replied. Small, precise actions are what's needed. Economy of movement, the absolute minimum to land a strike and keep your guard in place. You are young, Beowulf, but you are strong. You could hold a shield all day long and wait for your enemy to make a mistake, but you don't have the patience to do it. You never fought like that when you were my age, Beowulf complained. In a flash, his father's face was in front of his, nose to nose and Beowulf could smell the sweat of the man as he barked at him. And you think I set a good example, do you? You think that to glory in bloodlust and sacrifice control is good? Do I need to remind you of why we are here, Beowulf? He hauled Beowulf to his feet and pointed out to the forest. You want to learn to fight like an animal? Go learn from the bears. I will not teach you to fight like that. What do we learn here? To tame the fire, Beowulf intoned, the words drilled into the core of him. To tame the fire, his father agreed. Now pick up your weapons. We go again. And so they sparred again. It had been eight years since they had come to Hrothgar's hall. Edge the Owl had been true to his word, working with the Daneland warriors to form a defence against the raiders. At first they had been more of a militia, forming fast to respond to ships and fight back any raiders who came to land. In time, though, Ejtheow had raised up the Sea Wardens, setting two or three in post at a time with the constant duty of watching the coast. Equipping them with horns and establishing a system of calls, the Danes were now able to warn each other within a heartbeat of any ship seen on the horizon, and the warriors were well trained and drilled in how to respond. Under his tuition, the raiders had learned to respect the Daneland coast, and it had been months since the last ship landed. After five years, Beowulf had been deemed old enough to begin his own training, and he had enjoyed every moment, except for the ones like this morning. Still, he was becoming better with every day that passed, and his father was certain there was a bright future in store for him in the shield wall. Beowulf imagined it every day, the glory of standing shoulder to shoulder with his father to his right and his best friend Brecker to his left. For now, though, he had a lot to learn. As he walked back to his home, he felt a fresh bruise where another blow had landed, and again he was grateful that training spears were blunt. "'I am home, mother,' he called as he entered the house, and she hurried out to greet him. <laughs> "'My heart!' she called, 
wrapping him in her arms and kissing him on the forehead. Mother, Beowulf complained, I am almost a man grown, you should not do that any more. You may grow to be as high as a tree or as old as the sea, my heart, but I shall always hold you in my arms as I did the day I birthed you, and your forehead is mine to kiss by the will of the Almighty. She proved her point by kissing him again, and Beowulf wriggled away. Stop, he grumbled, but there was a broad grin on his face as he did so. This was a good moment. He had all he wanted in this time, and from the next room he could smell the delicious aroma of stewed apples and hot pastry which promised he might soon get all he wanted and more. It was only when he looked back at his mother that he saw her hand playing at her belt pouch, passing the edge between her fingers. You are nervous, he told her. What's wrong? His mother looked at him, a resigned sadness in her eyes. She took a deep breath and shattered his dreams. We are leaving Daneland, Beowulf, she told him. What? he asked, sure that he must have misheard. We are leaving she repeated. The time has come for us to return home. But this is my home, Beowulf protested. No, my heart, his mother replied. This is where we live. But these are Danes and we are Geats. We need to be back among our own people. Why? he asked. Why would we go back to people who turned their backs on us? His mother smiled kindly. A lot has changed since then, my heart. Your father has done all Hrothgar asked of him and more. There is no place for us here any longer. We must return to our own lands. I don't remember my own lands, Beowulf replied. But that wasn't strictly true. The memory of the day they left, the fire taking his childhood home, and the fear in his parents' eyes would be with him forever. You are making this decision without me. I don't want to return there. And yet you shall, said his mother. There was an edge to her voice now, an iron to her tone that Beowulf knew well, and it meant there would be no further discussion. He bowed his head, knowing this was not a battle he could win. "'When will we leave?' he asked in a sullen voice. "'In a few days, with a new moon,' his mother replied. "'You had best begin saying your farewells.' Beowulf left the house and wandered aimlessly, letting his feet pick the path, feeling as though the entire world was dropping from beneath him. He had been just six summers old when they came to Daneland, and he had no memories left of his time in Geatland, save that one. Fire and burning and promises of death. Why on earth would he want to return to such a place? Why on earth would anyone want to return to such a place? He looked up at last and found he was on the site of Herot Hall. With his father winning safety for the realm, the old king's dream of Herot had finally come to fruition. And now here it was, nearly complete. As he watched, people were hurrying to and fro, loading the new-built hall with barrels of ale, mead and wine, and hanging the walls with shields and tapestries. With nothing better to do, he sat on a ridge to watch. He did not know how long he had been there when a hand rested on his shoulder, and he looked up to see King Hrothgar next to him. "'A fine sight, is it not?' asked the old king. To see a thing that you have spent your nights dreaming of come to pass. Uncle, Beowulf responded, making to stand. Sit, sit, the king soothed, waving his hand to motion Beowulf back down. In fact, I may join you, and the old man made to sit. You cannot sit on the ground, uncle, cried Beowulf in alarm. Why can I not? asked the king. He looked around them. This is my kingdom, is it not? I believe a king may sit wherever his royal buttocks choose in his own realm. Uh, Yes, of course, Beowulf agreed hastily. But it is not... He struggled to find the words. You are not... You are old. Should I not fetch you a blanket or something? Old am I, replied the king. Well, at least I am not rude. He swatted Beowulf playfully before taking his place on the ground by his side. And I am not so old as for blankets just yet. Now, what troubles a fine young man such as yourself on a clear, bright day? Are there not spears to train with? Are there not boats to row? Should not you and Breca be swimming out to sea in another hair-brain scheme? He smiled wryly at Beowulf, and Beowulf grinned at the memory. But then his face turned sad once more. Mother tells me we're leaving, to return to Geatland. Ah, the old king nodded sagely. I see... His eyes stayed fixed on the people of his land, watching them as they loaded still more goods into the hall before them. 
I do not wish to go, he told the king. So I can see from your brooding. A gull cried up above, but the old king's eyes did not stray from the hall, and that sparkling smile was always in his eyes. It does not seem fair, Beowulf pressed on, not liking the tone of complaint that crept into his voice, but unable to stop it. And when, asked the king, finally turning to face him, was life ever based on what was fair? Have you stopped to ask yourself why your mother and father feel it is time for you to return? She tells me my father's work here is done. We must return to our own people. An idea sprung to his mind. If you were to give my father another role, uncle, then might we be able to stay? You might, young warrior, indeed you might. And I can always find work for men such as your father. But it is not him she is thinking of, not really. Then who is she thinking of? Beowulf asked. Of you, boy, the king jibed. She is your mother. If she's anything like my wife, then I dare say a great many of her thoughts are spent on her ungrateful offspring. His tone softened. Tell me, what do you know of your uncle? Well, you are my uncle, Beowulf replied, bumping his shoulder against the man. Not me, young flatterer, the king replied, returning Beowulf's shoulder bump with one of his own. Your mother's brother. What do you know of him? Well, she has three brothers, but her eldest is Hialak, king of the Geats. Indeed, the king agreed. Your uncle is a king. But why should that matter, uncle? You're a king also. I am, the king confirmed, but I am king of the Danes. And however much you may wish otherwise, you are not a Dane. But I am not a man who thinks of other clans as lower than his own Beowulf, you know that. The king interrupted, but a king does not rule his people, not really. He serves them. Mine is to serve the people of Daneland, to see that they are fed and protected and that they grow and thrive. This means I must always look for ways that I can better them, ways I can advance them. Them, Beowulf, not guests from other clans, however much I may love them. Do you see where I'm leading you? Beowulf nodded, he did indeed see. I am no warrior king, Beowulf. I am a gift giver and a builder. I take the deeds of other men as my own, men like your father, and I use those deeds to build a better place for all. Now, if you stay with my people, I can surely find work for your father, as well as a place for your mother, and in your own time I would welcome you into service. But so long as you dwell here, a guest in our land, there will always be a limit on how high you can climb. Among your own people, with your uncle as king no less, there is no limit on what kind of man you might become. But I do not care about such things, uncle, Beowulf complained. I would be happy as a simple spearman in your service. I believe you would, the king agreed, but you have the makings in you of so much more and it is not fair or right to hold you back from that. Your mother wants you to be the very best man that you can possibly grow to be, and the soil of Daneland is not the best earth for you to grow in, do you see? But I want... Do you see this hall, Beowulf? The king interrupted. Do you know how long I dreamed of this hall? Planned for it? Set aside gold to pay for it? A great many years, I shouldn't wonder, Beowulf replied. A great many years and more, the king confirmed. And do you think, after all that planning, that I should be happy to let it be built with rotten timber, with soft stone, with poor made clay? No. To be the hall I can leave to my descendants, it must be the best hall it can be. That, Beowulf, is how your mother thinks of you. She seeks to give you the best timber, stone and clay to build you into something that will leave a legacy. Will you begrudge her that effort? Beowulf hunched his shoulders, realising how selfish he had been. Of course not, uncle. Of course not, agreed the king. Now, go and speak to your mother and thank her for her years of care she has put into raising you. And help me up from this place. I am old and should not be sitting on this cold, damp ground. Why on earth did you not fetch me a blanket, boy? He let out one of the squawking laughs Beowulf had come to know so well, 
and Beowulf helped the king up and set off back to find his mother and apologize. The next night, Hierot held its first feast in honor of Beowulf's father and the peace he had brought to their realm. Hrothgar and Waltheo gave them gifts and treasure in return for the peace Ejtheow had won for them. You will always be welcome in the Danelands, he promised them. And for the first time, Hierot rang with the sound of music and dancing and merriment, just as Hrothgar had dreamed. When the time came, Waltheo passed a cup of parting around the hall, and all drank to their departure. The next morning, fresh with the tide, Beowulf, his mother and father, set sail to make their way back to their homeland. As Beowulf watched the place he had grown up fade, his eyes rested on Hierot, the old king's dream, and he felt sad that he would not be there to see all the feasting and merriment it would hold. He did not know it yet, but he certainly would return to that hall, because Beowulf and the Danes had not been the only ones to hear the sound of laughter and music and merriment at Hierot. Another had heard those sounds as well, and from his home, deep in the depths of the earth, he was stirring to seek them out. Thanks for listening. Beowulf was a Settle Stories Commission, written and read for you by John Buckridge. Story editor was Miriam Sarin. Intro music was Warrior by Hartsman. Outro music was Travel in the Ocean by Monument Music. It was a Parable Arts production.